In Greek mythology, Atlas was a titan who was sentenced to hold up the earth. I wonder what did this titan uh, did to be sentenced up to hold up her globes? There are times when I see art, um, particularly nude female figures, where I immediately know the gender of the artist. You know what I mean? first saw this sculpture in real life, the first thing I thought was, hmm, I wonder about that artist. Because the woman is incredibly idealized. Now it is Mother Nature, but he chose to depict Mother Nature as a Disney princess. Huge eyes, slim build, big. Daniel Popper creates these large scale sculptures, often with very similar idealized, Europeanized figures. This white, cis, straight, male, South African has epitomized beauty in a certain way. Understanding that does not take away from the beauty of the sculpture, but helps you think more about it. TikTok, how often do you see bosoms being used for this function? Over the history of art, there's been a decline of images being showing women as fertility symbols or mothers, and a sharp uptick in bosoms being shown in a sexualized nature. Why do you think that is, both in art and in TikTok? The Smithsonian made an amazing vote yesterday. They will be returning 29 bronzes that were stolen from Benin by the British in 1897. While the date of return has not been set, everything is in motion for these 29 beautiful sculptures to return to the continent of Africa. This video helps us to find the word pareidolia, where even inanimate objects with two dots and a, like a circle look like a fa It's an evolutionary coping strategy and it's fun. Personal accountability implies that it's people's choice to work in a capitalist system. All of us are in it, it is not our choice. Art existed long before capitalism. Capitalism has devalued labor in all kinds of human work, including art. And if you think you're making a choice in your labor and you're completely independent of the capitalist system, you're incorrect. Many Christian churches feature blue ceilings with gold stars. This motif actually predates Christianity, being found as early as the 2nd century BC in Palmyra. Traditionally, this blue was very expensive, being created from lapis lazuli found largely in Afghanistan. But in 1826, synthetic ultramarine was created. Have you heard about the time when John Lennon and Yoko Ono decided to be grave robbers in Egypt? In 1977, Yoko Ono and John Lennon hear about a secret excavation where they could take things. John Lennon was a big history buff. He was so excited about it that when he was at Saqqara, he actually took something uh, home with him. They were getting ready for their illicit excavation and somebody got tipped off that they were planning to steal stuff. So they had to leave Egypt in a hurry. How does gender play into how artists make art? Everybody is susceptible to the constructs of society. A classic example is to compare how artists of different genders depict the same scene. So let's think of the story of Judith and Holofernes. This Old Testament story is about Judith saving the Israelites by murdering the drunken Assyrian Holofernes. The lower image is a painting by Caravaggio. Here Judith is like the wilting damsel barely using her energy and almost squeamish about cutting off Holofernes' head. This image Beside me is by female artist Artemisia Gentileschi. And here you see Judith and her maid like really doubling down on taking care of the situation. Let's think about American conceptions of masculinity. Advertising is a great way to think about this because it depicts the ideal man. Let's do a comparison of two images from 1940. This is a pivotal year in American society. We are one year away from joining World War II, which is already raging in Europe, and we are coming out of the Great Depression. Here we see a man depicted as a breadwinner. He is suave, he's wearing a beautiful suit, and he's up with the times, there's an army plane behind him. And here's a good counter example. This man is a bumbling fool. He, at home, can't do what he needs. He has this ad sort of suggesting he is a helpless bachelor. So in the office and at war, 
a real man can do it. But at home... What's crazy about this glass that we're looking at? It's made with uranium. That's right, the radioactive element. In 1830s in Bohemia, they noticed that by adding uranium oxide to glass, you got a beautiful yellow effect. If you added uranium oxide plus iron oxide, you got this beautiful green effect. It became so popular globally that pressed glass was made in volumes. Four million pieces were made between 1958 and 1978 in the U.S. alone. If you find some green glass, expose it to UV light. If it glows, it's uranium glass. This video is a great way to define the word effigy. Usually an effigy is a sculpture of a person, often a famous person, like an effigy of an emperor. But thanks to the internet, lots of dogs have become famous, and these sculptures could be said to be effigies of those two dogs. Uranium glass is made from uranium. So does that make it radioactive? There are so many sources of radiation in the world, from the sky, from the land, uh, from things we eat, from the water. And according to the Museum of Radiation, uranium glass is pretty negligible in terms of the grand scale of sources of radiation. Did blue wigs become fashionable? Well, in the 1700s, the French wore blue powder, pink, and violet in their very fancy wigs. In fact, the giant wigs of the 1700s is where we get the phrase big wigs. Apparently, the horse prefers painting to printmaking, though their signature is a footprint. Reminded of the word amenophobia, which is a fear of eyes, surrealists thought that eyes could help you see invisible things if you could see right. I don't really hear much about syphilis these days. All right, then let's talk about syphilis. Syphilis was a huge epidemic in Europe in the 1800s, affecting more Europeans than the Black Death had in centuries previously. One of the symptoms of syphilis was the loss of hair. So many men turned to wigs to keep those luscious locks on their head. They often paired this with outrageous, beautiful garments. Even kings, like King George, was known to wear a wig. Our first president, George Washington, famously didn't wear a wig, though he powdered his hair. Not wearing a wig set him apart from his European rival. Body tattoos like these were most associated with Japanese Yakuza, or underworld criminals, so feared that exposing tattoos in public was often outlawed. Should non-Japanese people wear them? Tattoos were inspired by 19th century Japanese printmaker Kuniyoshi. Samurai killing big snake, quirky frog, red peony, raging river. And even more samurai. The idea is everybody's. And blue and white is, I think, a classic example. Blue and white porcelain is something that comes from China, uh, though it itself was very popular in the Middle East before it became iconic uh, as something Chinese. And the plate that this hairstyle is inspired by is probably a Chinese, an English plate inspired by China that was then painted onto the head of somebody who might be American. And it's fabulous. Profits are just money laundering and tax evasion for rich people. And completely in bed with the art world. What do samurai wear under their clothes? They wear a fundoshi, which is a single piece of cloth that is worn around the midsection. Fundoshi was worn under clothes, but also could be worn if you were swimming, if you were an average citizen, if you were just walking down the street, and if you were a tattooed samurai, if you were avenging something. It brings up the point that what is considered outerwear and innerwear is completely culturally determined. Don't believe me? Think about a bikini. It's largely not different than underwear. And a lot of people wear bikinis that are smaller than the regular underwear they wear. But we have culturally determined that one is okay as outerwear and one is not. T-shirts like Lizzo's were the thing in the 1980s. This was largely because of black entrepreneur Edwin Sacasa, who started Shirt Kings in 1986 in Queens, New York, using his graffiti skills to make t-shirts. Eventually, there were stands at every mall in America. The difference between a monument and a war museum. An ideal war museum should help you make sense of the war. Whereas a monument gives you a single point of view celebrating an individual or a group of individuals. The British Museum, not surprisingly, has set up a system where they make it very hard to give things back. I mean, it's in their charter. But I would argue that in Clause B here, unfit 
can be unfit because it's stolen. Secondly, if you notice this clause later in the charter, they can deaccession things. Deaccessioning is allowed. Every museum in the world has deaccessioned something, I believe. It's good collection care to deaccession things sometimes. So the charter is a set of words that they can hide behind or they can employ in equitable ways. Five second art history lesson here. So when you see those really thin brush strokes, if they're curly and it comes up off the surface, so like wavy, that's Van Gogh. If instead they're flat and they're long, it's often Renoir. Airbrushing just means blowing pigment with air to get a fine, even finish. Humans might have used it as early as the prehistoric era, but in the 1860s, there was a huge innovation, which was commercially made airbrush devices, making it almost foolproof. It became widely used for a variety of commercial purposes, like air touching photographs, for advertising and pinup dolls. By the 1960s, a number of pop artists used it, including James Rosenquist. Around that same time, Underground artist Stanley Mass was making t-shirts like this. And then in 1986, the Shirt Kings created their stand at a mall in Queens, New York. Eventually, it was almost at every mall in America. What does the stories that we tell about war tell us about what we think about war? Humans have been telling stories about war through visual culture for millennia. This is from ancient Sumer, 2500 BC. Let's just look at one comparison. This is the World War II Museum in New Orleans. This is our National World War II Museum. You see the many devices that were used in war showcased in this room without context. This is just war machinery. Here is the World War II Museum in Poland. You see that people are standing and it looks as if you're in the rubble of war. This is what happens when that machinery impacts people's lives. So what does it tell us? What does it tell us about the way that America perceived World War II versus the way that the Polish wanted to depict World War II? I find it fascinating that in the United States, we have so many monuments to Confederates, both in the North and in the South, many of which were uh, erected in the 1920s, funded by white women, when the Confederates tried to secede from the nation and were treasonous. I can't think of another place where people who lost a war have so many monuments on both sides of the nation. In this way, some museums are doing a great job of starting to rethink how we talk about the Civil War in a way that gives you a better sense of what actually happened. Here is the write-up from the Robert Lee Memorial, and you notice how they bring up the fact that it's a complicated history. What are your thoughts about when artists don't manufacture their work? This sculpture by Jeff Koons is a 37 square foot half dinosaur, half rocking horse. While he conceptualized this giant beast, he did not make it. It was commercially manufactured. Here you can see the scaffolding. Historically, plenty of artists worked in this way. They might have had a workshop like Rubens or Rembrandt. But Jeff Koons' works go for millions of dollars. So what are your thoughts about this sort of idea of contemporary art? That it's conceptual, but somebody else makes it. do we as a society tell stories about war? It might be to remember the fallen. It might be to forget what really happened. It might be to ensure that that past is always part of our present. Video is a great example of finding abstraction in nature. We know those are rocks. That's a lake. Those are clouds and mountains. But it's also just colors and shapes. Quick! Does the dollar symbol on the dollar bill have a single line like this or a double line? Where did the two symbols come from? Well, in Spanish America, they used the pesos de ocho, and that's how they derived the symbol with a single line. In English America, we used the dollar, which derives from the German word thaler. But now, the single line's pretty common, like in your phone. This highlights a lot of things about visual communication. The dollar is the currency for a lot of nations, so simplifying it to one line meant you could use the same symbol for all of them. Second, you might not have even noticed, sometimes you used a font that has a double line, because many typed fonts still do. And it shows how flexible our brains are. There's actually no approved or required number of lines. It just depends on the font. And interestingly enough, the dollar bill does not have the symbol in either form. 
on it. The unveiling of their first official joint portrait. This Watch that whole video to learn more about the symbolism. Let me also tell you a little bit about the artist, Jamie Corrath. His works are amazing. They look as if the people would just step right out of the frame. And that's because he works from life. Compare the photograph to the painting. The photograph has a hollowness. It seems flat. It's because photographs flatten things. Two, people are often uncomfortable, so you don't get to see their personality in the photograph. So instead, he spent months drawing and painting from life. Yo, I don't know who you are, but if we live with less individualism and more collective responsibility, we could see where all our paths intersect as one and life would be a whole lot better for a bunch of people. What is a museum? It's a place where you learn from collections. Museums keep, preserve, and share the most important and valuable story. The tale of the people in comparison to the whale made me immediately think about Japanese ukiyo-e prints. These woodblock prints were made to show scenes of everyday life. And so here you see a whale being hunted. And notice how the scale shows how much bigger whales are than people. Along with being monumental, you see the beauty of their form and how dynamic they are. It really reminds me of the scene we're seeing to the right. 